Uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, as, as Derek mentioned, I came here uh, in 1996, actually, uh, to work on the Quest Network. I remember uh, staring out the window of the Hyatt, I think it was, and there was this giant queue suspended by a helicopter waking me up in the morning, and I was like, wow, I guess we're, something's gonna happen, uh, which it did. It was a great, great story uh, of innovation. Uh, Quest was, how many people were here when Quest was around? Yes, yeah, so you remember the big blue blight on the building? That's what we called it. Uh, but yeah, it was a really great experience. It started my career. Uh, my career evolved uh, what I call up the OSI stack, which means nothing to you. It, it's what networks are built in. And so I started off in fiber and then moved up the stack to a much more human layer, uh, which was social media. I managed the lives of about 7,000 people inside of social media. Uh, we published, we would reach several billion uh, people a day. It was quite an experience. Uh, and uh, as Kat was talking about, uh, mental health had a lot to do with it because I had just sold my company in uh, December, or in October of 2015, and had a crazy series of events uh, of suicides. I had three suicides in a row, seven days apart. Uh, and so I kind of looked around and I was like, you know, what is, what is this all about? And why am I living in Hollywood for the last 20 years? And what really resonates with me as a person? And so I moved to Iceland. Uh, in 2011, I got a phone call from Bjork's management. Uh, she asked me to come over to help articulate her new career. Uh, it was during the time when record labels were, were kind of leaving the role that they played for artists, uh, and artists were kind of left on their own to build connections with their fans, and that's what I did uh, for a living. So I, I flew to Iceland uh, in October of 2011. I remember it was the worst weather I think I've ever been exposed to in my life. You know, there would be a Category 5 hurricane, uh, and, you know, they called it windy. Uh, and so I'm like walking horizontally and I, you know, the Bjork's management is like, look, you're not gonna be able to look at her, don't talk to her, she's on vocal rest. Cut to us almost naked in a fountain dancing at about three in the morning that night. So we bonded. Uh, I met a group of people uh, that were super cool uh, and uh, I just became fascinated as a gay kid from Mississippi with this weird volcanic island in the middle of the Atlantic. And so after this series of events and moving to Iceland and suddenly we bought a museum on the ocean and we were like, whoa, this is, this is all happening very quickly. My parents were like, you're gone crazy. Uh, and so they sent a talent manager who's a mentor of mine from Mississippi, uh, this crazy man, Larry Thompson, who like drives around in this Rolls Royce collection with his crazy hats and yells at me that I should drive a Range Rover. And I'm like, I don't want to look like a dick. And so, you know, this guy. And he comes over and he's like, Oliver, he's like, what in the world is going on with you? Why are you in Iceland? It's fucking cold. This weather sucks. And I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, well, why don't you do what you used to do to people when you would sit in a room with them and have to kind of get five values out of them so that you could become them in social media? You know, I would sit with a Hugh Jackman or Charlize Theron and be like, what are the five values that you have so that I can kind of make the Oprah magazine every day in Facebook of you because Oprah's always on the cover. You know, and that was my job, and so I did it to myself. And what I discovered is, is that I discovered that I really valued democracy and humanism. And humanism is a very interesting concept because people don't view it as a political concept or you know, as a societal concept necessarily. They don't really don't even know what it means. But when Iceland's economy collapsed in 2008, um, as a lot of Nordic cynical people do, uh, they went out in the streets with pots and pans. It was called the Pots and Pans Revolution. And they banged on the pots and pans until Parliament was kind of sick of it. And there was this comedian uh, who came up out of nowhere uh, to be in politics uh, named Myung Nar. His son, Frosty, is over here. Uh, well, Frosty was over there. He's already heard this. He's probably out back, you know, avoiding this. Uh, but his father, Myung Nar, um, was a comedian who ran for an election. It was the first political party ever uh, to appear uh, out of social media. So I was kind of fascinated with it. I had worked on Obama's uh, campaign uh, after Hope and had built the social architecture there. So I really had a love of kind of how, you know, democracy could flow through social systems. That is not the case today, people. Uh, it is rigged. 
Uh, I can tell you, I can tell you it's fucked up. Uh, and so, but he looked at Iceland, and Iceland had this crazy history of being humanistic. And so, uh, Jungnar created a political party called the Best Party, named after Tina Turner, Simply the Best, and won in a landslide. And so now there was this young woman who thought he was running for parliament, but really was now the head of Reykjavik city, and this man, and they're running the city now, and they're redoing the energy contracts, and they were really serious. I mean, it was, it was a really interesting point. But the point of this is he wrote, and you can Google it, he wrote an amazing treatise on humanism. And it just talked about how we should listen to old people and women more, and we should do these things, and it was all very funny. But he had this great line that said, we should participate in corruption openly, and therefore it will just be business. And so out of that, I was like, wow, that makes sense. So why don't I go into the most corrupt industry in the world, seafood, and participate in it openly and transparently. And so the next thing that Iceland has is a lot of culture, right? And I don't, you know, growing up as a kid in Mississippi, if I was doodling in my notebook, I was a faggot. And if I was playing on the guitar, I was a burnout hippie. Uh, which was on my way here. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, in Iceland, they celebrate it. You can have music lessons until you're dead uh, for free, and they, they really focus on the culture of it. That's why we have such amazing artists like Bjork and Sigur Ross and Kaleo and of Monsters and Men, and, you know, the list goes on. Iceland only has 350,000 people. There are, less, there are fewer than one million Icelanders in human history, and they're all related. It has a super connected society. Uh, you have uh, unbelievable bandwidth. It, it really is a different world when your phone works. Uh, it's pretty amazing. But what it also has is a cohesive community and thread. I think it has a lot of similarities, for instance, to Denver. You know, things like these programs that, that you know, and that's why we're partnered with people like Seattle Fish, because community matters to them and they, you know, they put their effort behind that. And so, Community has really kept a cohesive society, a society where you have 90,000 guns and no gun crime, zero gun crime, right? So it's not about that, it's about the community as well. And then you also have the most sustainable place on earth. Uh, zero hydrocarbons are burned on the island for fuel. It's all geothermal and hydroelectric. Uh, the Blue Lagoon is not a natural wonder, it's actually the effluent from a, a geothermal plant, but you can still go there and get your selfie. And to that point, 1.2 million people took their selfie in the Blue Lagoon last year. Uh, what happened is, is that after Eyjafjallajökull Hitliokul erupted in 2011, I believe, a bunch of Instagram people that were actually National Geographic photographers and Eric Chang and some other guys, but, but Instagram was birthed. And that's what led to a massive tourism boom in Iceland. Uh, when I first went there, about 400,000 visitors went to the island. This year, it will hit 3 million. Uh, and that was, you know, six, seven years ago. Uh, there are places around the world where social media has really impacted tourism. My favorite is this place called Trolltunga in Norway, where no more than 400 people had ever hiked the six hours to go be on this tongue of rock that you've seen in every Instagram photo. Now, if you Google it, you will see a line of 120 people waiting to go take their Instagram photo of them alone on a mountain, uh, which I find ironic. A picture always lies on Instagram, and definitely on Tinder. And so, <laughs> speaking of Tinder, uh, this fish, no. And so, when I got there, I was like, you know, I, uh, I really want to uh, do something interesting here. Uh, Walt Disney was my hero uh, when I was eight years old. Um, that's why I'm wearing a Paramount t-shirt. I was like, it's pretty ironic. Uh, Walt Disney was my hero when I was eight. My dad took me uh, to Epcot and like, I thought I was so special. Like we snuck out, you know, and went and saw how they would clean it with the power washers. I was eight, you know, I was really excited about that. And then when I was 15, I won the science award uh, for discovering a region on the human platelet uh, at the, the uh, ISEF, which is sort of like the spelling bee, but the science part version of it. And so I won that at up.